minor, right there. Got it? I should turn off my, my turn my in ear on because I can't hear anything. And
light for my eyes all that I need you daily provide deep in my being more than my blood my very You're the hope in my heart, you're the light in the dark, and you hold me in your hands, oh most high, oh most high. You're my strength when I'm weak, you're the grace that I need, and your mercy saved my soul, oh most high, oh most high. I will sing of your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. You are good, so good, all the time, all my life. You are good, so good. Your love remains, you never change. You are good, so good. And I'm still singing because you are so good. In the flood and the flame, you are making a way. You will never let me go, oh, most high. Oh, most high. Every word you have said, you will never forget. All your promises will stand, oh, most high, oh, most high. I will sing of your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. You are good, so good, all the time, all my life, you are good so good your 
love remains. You never change. You are good, so good. And I'm still singing because you are so good. So good. See if you can sing this with me. I'm holding on to your promises. I'm holding on to your faithfulness. I'm holding on to your promises. I'm holding on to your faithfulness. You are good, so good, all the time, all my life. You are good, so good, your love remains, you never change. You are good, so good, and I'm still singing because I know you are good, so good, all the time. All my life, you are good, so good. Your love remains, you never change. You are good, so good. And I'm still singing because you are so good, so good. Oh, oh. Lord, you are so good. Oh. so good. Amen.
everyone what you complete is completely done amen thank you lord love on your neighbor while stevie p makes his way Testing, check, all right. Now, that's plenty loud. You can probably bring it down just a little. Unless I have to talk quietly. How y'all doing? I'm with Henry. Great day today. Thank you, Lord. And got us ready so we can have a nasty day tomorrow, right? Uh, 40s and rain. Yeehaw. Good for penguins and ducks and geese, I guess, and all that. And for those who like Seattle weather. Uh, anyway, nonetheless, we're here. We're here now. And I appreciate Henry and the, Ashley for leading us in worship. Uh, do much better than I would do if I was leading you in it. If you've got your Bibles, let's go back to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and we'll use it for a diving board to, again, go back and look at some of these things that uh, this writer or writers of Hebrew, and like I said, it could be plural because we're never told who it was, but uh, what they have to say about faith and us learning and grasping so that what? So we can think about our faith and do I have faith like this? That's the whole idea of the prompting here. It's looking back at uh, the Old Testament Hebrews the Jewish people, and the writer obviously speaking to the Hebrew people, is giving them examples so that they would stop and go, wow, we have an ancestral base of faith all the way through, and look how it worked out with God, and look how those people were commended. And in the same regard, then why don't I do the same thing? Not only begin in faith, but stick with the faith and follow it all the way through to the very end. Last week, uh, we took a look then at the idea of Abel versus Cain, and not that we're to let them compete not that they were competing in the eyes of god it was just that 
the way it worked out with their offerings and all. And uh, hopefully it gave you some perspective there in regard to our worship, which is an offering, as well as what we do in our giving, whether it be in service or in our funds, or I mean in both those areas. And uh, it all has to do again with faith. If we're doing it in response to God, this is what you're worth. God, this is how much I think of you. He's pleased. It thrills him no end that we would do something on behalf of him, do something in his name or do something in his honor. And that's what our lives are supposed to be. But uh, especially here, what we do with church ought to be practice for it so that we incorporate it into our lives. And if you remember, we followed up or completed it with looking at 1 Samuel, seeing that uh, Samuel the prophet had to speak uh, to the king Saul, who became faithless as it went along. He had less and less faith and began in God and did more and more faith in himself. One of the dangers that we all face, especially if you're somewhat successful to the world standards or you're a fighter inside, and I don't mean by necessarily with your dukes, but you are one of those that you're going to be a survivor. And it's real easy to begin to think, wow, I did this. Look at me. What a good boy am I? And uh, looking at King Saul, then we saw where uh, in the end of when it was all said and done, and even though he was offering those multitude of sacrifices and everything like that, Samuel just shook his head and said, do you think that's what impresses God? He said, man, your arrogance is like the sin of witchcraft. And so he really corrected him and tried to bring him into an understanding. But Saul was persistent in the wrong direction. Instead of being broken, he was persistent about being, became even more like steel. And thus we know eventually David took his place. Uh, but Saul even tried killing David because it was David embodied then this faithfulness and this love of God that kind of drove Saul nuts. And it allowed this demonic spirit inside of him to incite him towards anger and all. And I mention this, not that I'm afraid that any of you are going to be so angry you're going to go out and kill somebody and not that like Cain did in killing Abel because God liked their offering better. But I do believe that uh, in spite of the fact that competition happens within Christians and within churches, and it's not about us comparing ourselves to one another. It's about us comparing ourselves to ourselves and to Christ and what he did for us, that that's the faithful Christian life. It's looking and saying, wow, Lord, you did all this for me. What can I do for you? I can never pay you back, but I can live in a way that shows two things. I appreciate what you've done, which is cool. But the real neat thing is, and Lord, I appreciate the fact that you promised to cleanse me of my sins and to dwell within me with your Holy Spirit. So it's both things. It's our appreciation, but it's also this supernatural power that's now been given to us that we can do things that we never would have done on our own. We can live in a way you just could not have done in the flesh. And so what's sad is, is when we get into just this fleshly living, not just the fleshly sinful part of it, but just the normal human nature. And we just kind of get into this thing of, I'm going to do what I can do, or I'll only do it if I can impress. And we know Jesus's ministry spoke about that, right? Because he said, don't do your acts of righteousness to to be seen by men. Whether it was giving, whether it was sharing with somebody, all these things, whether it was praying and praying to be seen by people and all like that, he said, don't do it to be seen. He said, rather instead, do it. I see things done in secret, meaning in which God says, man, I know not only what you seem to be doing, I know the heart with which you do it. I know the mindset that you have. I know the attitude that you have and the motivation that's behind it all. Now, it's, some people read that as being very constrictive and oh no, but rather instead, isn't that so cool? Even though everybody in the room might misunderstand tonight as I go to pray and think that I'm praying to be seen by men, God knows. And God knows that I know that it wouldn't be a sermon at all if I go ahead and talk on my own. So let's go ahead and invite him to uh, speak through. Father, tonight, um, not only through my mouth, but through your word and by the power of your spirit, Lord, connecting as you are the hound of heaven that continually, Lord, even for those of us that have received you, you still search for us. You search for more and not because, God, you're some kind of a glory hound yourself. No, rather instead, you just know what's best for us. And there couldn't be anything better for us than to live for you. Couldn't be anything better for us than to not just believe in you, but to believe to the point it brings about action. And I thank you, Lord, for the various books of the Bible, but especially this book of Hebrews and especially this chapter that shows us what faith is all about. And that, Lord, it really is us not just believing you exist, but believing you made us with a purpose. You designed us, Lord. Uh, the attributes that other people may enjoy and appreciate, and even, Lord, those parts of us that we ourselves wish were different. You made us, Lord, and you made us with a purpose in mind. And that purpose would not just be what we could do with our flesh and our strength and our talents, but rather instead what we can do with our surrender. And I thank you for that. I mean, who else? What other God would take our weaknesses? 
but you will. All the rest of the gods that it seems would always want our strengths. But God, you actually ask us to lay our strengths aside that we could be, Lord, weak inside of you, to die to ourselves, that we could be alive in you. And I just pray, God, that your word would be able to cleanse us as well as to build us up. And God, what I really love is as we look at this, these passages on faith, that your word tells us that it's by your word that we have faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. And so, Lord, tonight I would pray that in spite of my speaking, it would be you behind it, that you would inspire, that you would comfort, you would encourage, correct, direct, whatever it is, Lord, that each of us might need, that each one of us here tonight, Lord, not only up here, but the teachers teaching downstairs, the kids that are memorizing passages, Lord, for each and every one that's in this building, and Lord, others that are listening in, God, in faithfulness, uh, seeking to just grow in their own walk, God, I pray tonight that we would hear from you. And that in that, Lord, it wouldn't come in one ear and out the other, but it would come into our hearts, build up our faith, and let us be more active for you tomorrow. Not just to be a people that are busy doing stuff, but God, active for you, alive for you, and recognizing the people that we can serve. All of it in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So here at Acts chapter 11, um, no farther than it is, let's go ahead and read the whole thing and the beginning at least part of it. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we don't see. Uh, we know that this is what the ancients, and that's what he kind of goes back and does this hall of fame here for us, what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand, we comprehend that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen wasn't made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings, plural. And by faith, he, even, he still speaks even though he is dead. Then this next one that we'll look at tonight. By faith, Enoch or Enoch, if you want to call him that, but I've always heard it Enoch, but E-N-O-C-H. Enoch, and I can't tell you why we call him that, but it's just, that's what I've always heard, and it sounds better than Enoch. But Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And then the principle of verse six, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So here's this guy named Enoch, that we don't know a lot about. We'll go back and read about him in the Old Testament. But what we do know about him is he experienced something that we're only told in Scripture of one other individual specifically experienced. And that's what they call being translated from here to heaven. Not being translated like we speak a different language and somebody interprets for us, but he was just literally taken from earth and whoop, taken to heaven without experiencing death. Who's the other one that experienced the same thing? Somebody say? Remember the Moses. It wasn't Moses. Now Moses was similar. Who? Elijah. Elijah. Elijah was the other one. Yeah. Elisha and Elijah kind of get mixed up, but Elisha was the one that followed Elijah, and uh, he actually watched him kind of go up in a whirlwind, and uh, it was this amazing sight. Now Enoch, it seems as though nobody was there. It was just one day he is, and the next day he's not. Woof, he's just gone. Uh, they had him on milk cartons for centuries and couldn't find him. And now, but he was in heaven the whole time. Now, I realize for the people that really have been missing that that's not a funny thing, but I just had to throw that in there because it's my weird, quirky humor, you know? Anyway, so this Enoch, he was taken from this life. He did not experience death and uh, just couldn't be found because God had taken him, just taken him away. But before he was taken, it says that he was commended. And I presume by God as one that pleased God. Now, I don't know how in that day and age that God spoke and did all these things. I mean, we presume and kind of get the feeling when we read it that he came down and it was in this, you know, embodiment or a ball of fire or a ball of light and somehow or another took. We're not told that. I don't, in fact, I kind of lean toward the fact that God spoke to them like he does to many of us today. Not with this big thundering, booming voice out of the clouds, but rather instead with that still small whisper that Elijah recognized God or as being God's voice. I personally believe that it's that part that takes even more faith. If all of us could hear God speak and thunder from the clouds, I mean, and I would love to have a Sunday that we, I could just sit back and whether it's the front row or the back row, I've always wondered what's about, good about the back row. But, you know, if I could just sit there with you and let God just speak, boy, wouldn't it be easy? Now, there would be some that would be skeptical and go, how do we know they're not just doing something with extra speakers or this or that? But I mean, wouldn't it be easy if we could literally hear God speak? But isn't it, doesn't it take more faith when we listen and it's inaudible, but it's so clear? 
or as we listen and we seek and we search for understanding or direction that we might go in. That's why I think it's very critical that the questions that we ask God and what we're seeking are things that he can answer instead of seeking things that he's already answered. I think a lot of people waste a lot of time asking God about stuff that in his word he's already spoken. Um, Especially when it comes to some of these things about God, what do you want me to do? Now, I've prayed that and I pray that. But if what we're talking about is, God, I can't make up my mind whether to sin or not to sin, he's already spoken about that. You know, he doesn't really, he's not going to give you any singular pass and go, you're one of my favorites, I'll let you get by with it. Because if you're his favorite, guess what? The reason he says don't sin isn't because he wants to keep us from having a good time. He wants to have us, for us to have a great life. And so these things that he speaks about are for greatness and for godliness, not uh, a, something that we might lack. But too many times we're praying about things that God's going, look, that's not really valuable. You need to look to see what I believe is. Um, I'm going to stop here for a moment. Henry, do you mind just going to the thermostats back there, at least kicking the fan on so it circulates? I see several people fanning. Is everybody plenty warm? Okay, almost a little bit hot because it feels kind of warm in here to me, but I just at least got the fan circulating. Okay, so this Enoch, he's commended as one that pleased God. We read right after verse 6, without faith it's impossible. So Enoch demonstrated apparently out of the ordinary faith. And when I say out of the ordinary, I mean certainly all of us are able to recognize ordinary people and it's almost like it's funny because you recognize ordinary people because you don't recognize them, right? Did you get that one over there? Thanks, I'm sorry. Not that I'm trying to order you around, brother, but you've already done your fair share. But if you don't mind, I just know that you're the drywaller. You know how to adjust those thermostats. All right, now. So Enoch is commended. He's not just ordinary. He shows an extraordinary faith. God is one of those that, I mean, he's thrilled with our efforts and he's thrilled with what we do. And we know that without faith, it's impossible to please him. So when we show faith, it's pleasing. And I don't know what it was Enoch did. We're not told. Other than the fact that simply he walked with God. And that this was enough that it brought this, this thing out of God, this, I don't know, flutter in his heart or this delight or whatever it may have been. But it really truly seems as though there's something exceptional here that God gets to the point and says, man, I just love you so stinking much. Come on up, you know, come on down, as Bob Barker would say. You know, come on, let's go. And Enoch did. Now, I, I can't tell you what it would take. And some of you would be really weirded out because if I could tell you, you'd say, well, I'll never do that because I don't want God to just take me out. And, you know, that explains a lot where we're at. Because the truth of the matter is, there are a lot of Christians that live really wanting to stay here. Well, I want to see this, and I want to do that, and I hope to experience or whatever. And, you know, a part of it shows what our value system is, the things that we may want. And I'm not saying that kids and grandkids are bad and wanting to see your children married or whatever it may be that way or to attain certain things. I'm not going to say they're altogether bad, but I'll tell you what, right now, the greatest thing that you can want to attain is the presence of God. There's nothing greater than that, to dwell in that presence of God. And I'm not just talking about in heaven, but when you dwell in his presence on this earth, you please him. And it's, there that, it's that heart that he's able to use in a way that he can do his bidding and his will on this earth. It's when we live in a faithfulness that we just desire to spend the time. We wake up talking to God. We spend the day talking to God. That, you know, it's, we don't, nobody has to tell us to pray. You can't help but pray. And believe it or not, there are people that are that way. There are people that just literally are in love with God. And, you know, that's the sad thing about it. That means that there's some of us that really aren't. But what do we do with what we love? Whether it's a thing, whether it's our favorite restaurant, a movie that you just saw, or a, a band that you love to hear play, when it's our, our thing that's happening right now or it's the new car that we got or it's a new TV set or the new TV program that came on, what do you do about it? One, you'll set your DVR and you'll watch it and two, you'll tell other people, hey, you ought to see that show, it's really good. Or hey, come look at this or come see that. Or hey, did you know we got to go do, you ought to go do that sometime. We talk about what we love and like and we also experience it. And so if we love God and we like God, wouldn't we talk about him a lot? And so as a kind of a gauge, I just want to encourage you to stop and think back. Look back at your life this week, you know, three days from Sunday. Look at your life this month already. We're what, you know, about a week into the month of February here. What's happened? And compared to other things that you talked about, how much has God filled your conversation? When you think about it, in in our guys group, Kirk brought up the other night or whatever, just the difference with, you know, 
I listen to talk radio way too much, probably. And one of the things that I cannot stand are the people that call in, and no matter who it is, and they go, hey, how you doing? They've been waiting online maybe 40 minutes, an hour, or whatever, you know, to get on. And the first thing they tell this person is, how you doing? Now, you know, it's not that that's a bad thing to say, but it's pretty mindless most of the time, right? I mean, how many of us genuinely really want the person that we're speaking to to tell us exactly how they're doing? Well, you know, I ate this thing last night, and, it, and they could go into something, you know. Or right now, you know, I've got 15 things going on here right now, and I didn't have time for your phone call. You know, if you really tell them how you're doing, you say, click, because I don't, I don't have time for that. And it's like, don't waste my time listening to somebody going, fine, how are you? And then you've got to wait for them to respond. You know, it's like, can't we condense this a little bit and make it like you're saying with me at this sermon tonight? You know, can't we condense this a little bit here? But, you know, when we ask somebody how they're doing, do we really care? Now, I'm not saying that none of you that ask are genuine. I'm not saying that for a moment. I can't know your heart or anything. But how much time do we spend telling somebody about what's not going right in our life or about the latest frustration versus how much do we spend about how great our God is? And, and I only mention that from a mind-stimulating perspective because, you see, if we really love God, we can't wait to talk about him. If you really don't care about God, he'll always be an afterthought. And if that's the case, it's not shame on you, bad on you. It's instead, why don't you say, God, I want to pick this up a little bit. How do I become like Enoch and become one of these people that you would even commend, that you would look at and go, now that's what I'm talking about. That's the relationship that I want to have. What would it take, God, for you to look at me and say, that's what I'm talking about? As you think about people in your life that have inspired you toward your walk with God, what were they like? More than likely, they weren't pushy about their Christianity, but they couldn't hide it either, right? Whether it was in their kindness, in their eyes, in the way that they handled situations of people they loved, or whether it was the way they handled situations of people that you would hate, you can look at them and see certain characteristics that always came out, and it had to do with the way that they spoke and they handled themselves. And especially then you begin to get the sense that it's rooted in their prayer life and their Bible reading. And I mention that because I think all of us want to be, quote unquote, good Christians, right? But what do we think? How is it going to happen? And what I want you to know as we go back and look at this life of Enoch, it doesn't just happen because you one day go, okay, God, from now on, I'm going to be a good Christian. It happens because you cherish God and you love him and the relationship with him. And you spend the time to where he actually begins to rub off on you. Back to the book of Genesis, if you will, chapter five, to find out there's not really a lot that we can read about Enoch, but there's just things we can read between the lines here and maybe begin to perceive. So we read back there in Hebrews that from a New Testament perspective, under the inspiration of the Spirit that this writer or writers of Hebrew wrote about, that they talked about Enoch as one who pleased God. They talk about the fact that he was and then he was no more because God just took him away, that he did not experience death. And so as we go back here to read about it, it begins in chapter 5 and This is the uh, Genesis account, and Genesis is written by Moses, and God must have given Moses this history because Moses didn't live through all this as he gave him the history about creation and the different things that Moses and faith wrote down. And uh, a part of that is this kind of account of the large generational shifts, okay, what happened from one to another. Not about every single individual is ever born, but from Adam all the way through this kind of a godly bloodline, okay, that took place. And just for the fun of it, to get into the boring part about this, where a lot of people start reading their Bible at the first year and they quit because it's like, oh, come on, you know, enough already. But I'm going to read it to you. This is the written account of Adam's line. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. And when they were created, he called them. Now, this is something that maybe a lot of you didn't know. He called them man. Do what? Yeah. When we talk about mankind, that's why. We don't have to talk about person kind. Mankind was what God called him. In fact, the word Adam wasn't just singular. It encompassed Adam and Eve. And that's kind of an interesting thing. And I don't want to get too bogged down it, but I'll just give you that. And you can go read and do your own study on that. See what you come up with. But, but I want you to know that God saw them as one. And so he made them man. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. Now, wait a minute. We thought there was Cain and Abel. There was. But after Cain and Abel, then what Eve calls him is Seth because he replaced or God has given me another son to take the one that I lost, meaning the one that was killed, you know, that Cain killed with Abel. 
And so that's where this picks up, that another, or 130 years old, Adam has his son named Seth. It was in his own image, just like God was, or that man was made in God's image or likeness. And after Seth was born, Adam lived another 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived a pretty long life, wouldn't you say? How long? 930 years. Then he what? He died. All right. When Seth had lived 105 years, he became the father of Enosh. And after he became the father of Enosh, Seth lived 807 years. And in the meantime, had other sons and daughters. And altogether, Seth lived 912 years. Then he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he became the father of Kenan. He was a youngster when he had it, you know, comparatively. When he was 90, just a teenager, you know, and maybe really you could consider in the single digits. But uh, he became the father of Kenan. After he became the father of Kenan, Enosh lived 815 years, had other sons and daughters. Altogether, he lived 905 years, and then he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he became the father of Mahalalalalalalal. And after he became the father of Mahalalal, uh, Kenan lived 840 years, had other sons and daughters, and altogether, Kenan lived 910 years, and then he died. Kind of see a pattern? Guess what? No matter how long you live, Unless you happen to live until Jesus comes back, you're going to what? Die. Now, I don't mean to be, you know, ignorant about that. I want us to be smart about that. The truth is we're going to die. And the great thing is God lets us know that. He doesn't try to lead us to believe that we're going to live forever. The other part of it that's really interesting is, is that uh, you go on up into chapter 6, and that's when I mentioned last week that God said, you know, I'm going to put a limit on man's days, 120 and from after the time of the flood, it seems as though people suddenly live 10% of what they'd lived before. These people that used to live, I mean, and basically you look at it and you could take the guy that lived 930 years, it would be like we would look at somebody 93 years old today and go, holy smokes, especially depending on how young you are, right? I mean, I remember when 50 was like a foot in the grave, you know, and uh, I'm there. And, uh, but you know, I mean, people seemed old. I mean, my grandparents, I was like, oh, good night, you know? And I didn't realize how young they were at the time, but uh, I was fortunate enough to have even great grandparents alive on several sides of the family or on both sides of the family. And, uh, you know, the, I, at the time I didn't know, but boy, they seemed so old. And, and yet nothing compared to this 900 and some years, 800 and some years, wait until you're, you know, 180 to even have kids the first time. I mean, it's just kind of phenomenal. But the part that God began to see was what? Even then, people thought they'd live forever. And what happens? What's dangerous about that? Um, you don't live with any fear of dying. And so you always presume you have what? Tomorrow. Can you imagine, as old as some of us are, if we thought that, you know, I'm 10% of what I'm going to live? I'm going to live to be five or 600 years old? I'll accept Jesus when? When I'm 499, you know? But that's how people think. And it's not recommended, it's not wise, but that's what was taking place here. And yet the truth of it was, each one of them died. I think it's amazing that we have this historical context. You might go, well, how did Moses come up with this? And I'm just gonna tell you, I believe God showed him or told him. But we have this written account. And so I'm not, I would rather take my odds and chances of this because I don't know how long Napoleon lived. But I can get a history book and it'll tell me why do I believe that? Well, people saw Napoleon. Okay, God saw this, you know, so what? God made us. So there's things here, but I think it's interesting just to look at this life pattern and how things come and they go. But it didn't really seem to make a lot of difference when they had a child or how long they lived or whatever, they all died. We read then in verse uh, uh, 18, when Jared, who was Mahalahel's son, uh, had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. After he became the father of Enoch, Jared lived another 800 years, had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Jared lived 962 years, and then he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, I mean, we're talking first grader here. When he lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, this is the part you want to get your highlighter out. Enoch walked with God. Hmm. So what happened? Well, he walked with God 300 years. He had other sons and daughters. Altogether, he lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and then he was no more because God took him away. It doesn't say like it did to everybody else. Then he died. God just took him away. 
Now, as we look at this, I think it's a very intriguing passage. And again, I can only go off of what I sense in my heart. Uh, I'm not going to tell you God told me or anything else like that. But what I see here is I think that this man's life changed after he had a child. There's something that took place because it implies the idea that before he was 65, before he had a son, he did not what? Walk with God. That his life was his own. Even though he had grandparents and great-grandparents, he had different ones like that and had a great history, he didn't need God. But man, there was something when that child was born, and especially when this little boy was born to this dad, that Enoch saw something that he'd missed out on his whole life, and that is that there is a God. I've talked with a lot of different parents, and especially grandparents, and they believe, that's what I do, that birth is a miracle. How does, I mean, I understand the biology. I grew up on a farm, but I still don't understand. I know what they tell me, and I know how it takes place, but it's like, for those of you that are parents, to know that not just that you had a part like you worked this out but just that you god took a part of you and a part of somebody else to make this child and that they've got your genes and part of your chromosomes and and everything that's taken place inside of them and there are things that you see and i think every parent does look for and one parent's always disappointed if they really really favor one side of the family more than their own or whatever but you look at their eyes and you look at their face and you look at their actions and their mannerisms and various things and as they grow and they change you begin to see things and it's like oh my and then as you grow yourself depending on what your walk with god is like you begin to go oh my right because isn't one of the most haunting things when the, that little baby grows up to be a teenager and suddenly they're a little more free or they have a lot more freedom than they'd had before and now what begins to set forth in your mind? Ooh, I hope they don't do what I did when I was their age, right? No, you don't want to admit that, but that's what you think, isn't it? Oh my, well, you're gonna go ahead and change them and they're sweet little darling here and they're not gonna, but that's what begins to bother. But you back up and I have to think that Enoch here at 65 years old when he became the father of Methuselah he saw something in this child that suddenly brought together not only his own fingerprints, but God created me and God created my child. What am I doing with that God? This is pre-Jesus, pre-Ten Commandments, pre-any kind of law, no Moses, no nothing. I mean, God's there, I don't know how. And God apparently speaks because he commended, but we're not told anything other than that it was just this thing that was going on and that people began to sense. And in their senses, they demonstrated their love and their response. They thought God was worth having a relationship with. There's a purity to it that's so cool because it doesn't seem to be based upon a preacher or some kind of a religious leader pulling everybody together to tell them how to do it. And I don't ever intend to be up here telling you how to do it. I'm just telling you, man, you look at this and what are you, if God is just to be discovered, how adventurous are you about the discovery of God? Or do you presume God? You presume you know him and you know about him. You presume, well, I've got God, I've got Jesus in my heart. You know, that's all that counts. Really? Because I look at Jesus and I see that he spent that time with those 12 disciples and it was because there needed to be more than just having God in your heart. There needed to be taking him down in deep and learning how to walk with God so that you didn't miss the experience but rather instead would enjoy the experience and embrace the experience so that it didn't become a religion. And it's why I hate religion because religion just has this kind of monotonous, mechanical, robotical mo movements that you go through and, and it's almost like check your brain at the door and don't think but just do what we tell you to do and then we'll promise you at the end that God will take you into heaven because we told you he would. And I think the relationship is altogether different than that. Just as it is, whether you're a worker with an employee, you can go through robotical motions and maybe do your job and it'll be fine or you can build a relationship and work for the company you know, and there's a huge difference in how it appears and seems when you put your heart into it. And God knows and deserves that same thing. I believe Enoch, compared to all these others, really put his heart into it. But I think he became fascinated with God, fascinated with his son. But the one thing that I find so ironic here is that even though compared to all the others, even though he was only 365 years old, about a, you know, a little over a third of what some of these people were living to be, I don't find him kicking and screaming going, no, 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 I want to see my child grow up. I don't see him at the least, but there's nothing implied here that says that after he's walking with God that he was mad because God took him away. It's almost as though 
It was like, isn't this what it's all about? And I really personally believe that that's what death can be like if we'll allow ourselves to expand our mind and be more than human but become more divine. If we can really begin to believe that God did determine the time set for us, this birth date, but even the end date. And that we don't know what it is, but what an adventure that we get to go until we find out what it is. And why don't we live in a way like it could be today, it could be tomorrow. And we embrace it instead of, oh man, I don't know, I'm not ready to go yet. Because you see, to me, folks, it's all about walking with God. Where I screw up is when I quit walking with God, or I forget to walk with God, or I start walking on my own, or I start just living this life and what a meager existence that is. And I'm not talking about not having any stuff, I'm just talking about How sad, spiritually speaking, if we're so content with this world that we don't have any desire to go and to be with God. I'm with you, and I've said as well, but I just soon God blow the whistle now and take us all. I don't want any more funerals. I just soon go. But I believe that if God doesn't take us, it's because there's something we can contribute and something that we can do with our life to help somebody else with theirs. What do you think? And isn't that why Jesus leaves us here? It's either to be saved and get to know him or it's in our getting to know him and salvation that we let somebody else in on it as well. I quite honestly can't find any other reason that I'm still alive other than the fact that there's still somebody that God is going to use me to help them get to know him better. And I believe I have a mission and that mission is that, that he's called me to. And it's not that I'm the only one. It's just that I'm the one that's going to be a fit in certain places. For some, it's going to be introducing them to Christ. For others, it's going to be they've been introduced for Christ for years, developing them in Christ, but that God's got a mission. But I don't think my mission's any different than all of yours, except on Sundays I stand up here on Wednesday nights, but that he uses me to proclaim it a little bit more. But it's still about building relationships. But my relationship with any and every one of you isn't going to do me any good if I don't have a relationship with god right i mean we can be friends but who needs another friend we need brothers and sisters in christ we need this discovery thing we need to find out why this writer in hebrews also said don't forsake that assembling together there's a reason that god designed the church to get together and it's not just to have meetings but it's that through those meetings we not just meet with each other but we meet god in one another and we meet god we get to go know god at even a better level with more depth, with more personalization. But on our own, we can kind of begin to take God for granted. And it's really bizarre, but you've got to look at this as being that the main current, the main river that we live in every day of our life is one that's swiftly going this direction and that it's going to be the most easy to live it in a way that as we're going down the river that we collect all these things. We collect our children we collect our houses we collect our cars and our jobs and we collect more money to get more of them and the whole time we're thinking that we're being successful as we get our arms fuller and fuller where when you swim upstream what you begin to realize is is man i want to be able to lead and i've got to let go of my stuff to be able to lead my family closer to god but as i do that and they're on the way i can begin to grab others that are friends as well and let's go ahead and let's swim upstream with everything we've got because god's worth it let's not just get taken down the drain let's live in a way that we tell god you're valuable to us and i can't wait to see you but some people honestly i mean and to me it's so backwards it's almost like they fear going to be with god for what they're going to leave instead of the other way around about fearing if i hold on to this what i'll miss with god and i honestly believe that it ought to be in the christian's heart that we're prepared we're ready because of what jesus has done but we want to take everybody we can with us as well but that our life's one of those things that we don't keep, God keeps. He's the one in charge of not just keeping us alive, but leading us in our purpose. And the greatest purpose we'll ever serve is the greater way or the way that we can get to know him in greater ways will help others in also in getting to know him. I believe that Methuselah was a gift from God. I believe any parent that has a child would agree with me that your child is a gift. But I think it's pretty funny that sometimes we begin to cling to our gifts You say, well, God wouldn't be an Indian giver and give it to me and then take it away. I can't tell you that. I don't want to begin to speak on how God works, but I believe he gives every life that we come in contact with, and whether it's a child or a grandchild or a good friend, that every life you come in contact with is a gift from God to help you to see him better, and that if you love him, you'll also help them to see him in a better way. This Enoch, 60-some years old, 65 years old, He has his son, and after he becomes a dad, he walks with God. 
for 300 years. For the next three centuries, he walks with God. He's in an active participation of a current walking with God. It's not that he walked with God on that day and then that was it. It was static. No, he continued. He perpetuated this walk. 300 years. While it, he had other children as well. And the, he doesn't say what their names were or anything else. It doesn't say that, that they were more favorite than, than his first one or that Methuselah was more of a favorite than them. No, it doesn't say any of that. God was still his favorite. And each one of the children that he had that I believe that he told them about God. But he walked for 300 years with God. And all we can read here is that after that, he walked with God and then he was no more because God took him away. And again, me reading between the lines, I just think that God couldn't stand it any longer. and says, come on, man, you're so cool. Get up here with me. There's nothing more I could do with you. I want you up here more than you need to be down there. And isn't that a great way to look at the end of life? is that God wants us. But I'll ask you this. Who do you want? Who do you want in your house? Who would you want to come live with you for a year? Somebody you don't like? No. Nah. Worse than that, somebody that doesn't like you, right? That's usually the people we don't like very well. But man, there are some people that you think it would be kind of cool having them hang around all the time. And that's the way I think that God was. But I don't think that Enoch went kicking and screaming because I think Enoch was just nuts about God. He might have been one of those overbearing witness to anything kind of people. It's like some of you have heard me tell before. The, uh, I, I used to love these witnessing illustrations or whatever. And one of the ones I came across was this older lady that um, was nearly blind and a little bit hard of hearing. And she went into the general store and, and got her stuff. She's come back out and she bumped into the old wooden Indian that was standing there. And she bumped into him and said, excuse me, my son, excuse me. Do you know Jesus? And she went into this whole thing about who Jesus was. The two old guys are sitting there on the bench. They elbow each other and said, man, she's talking loud enough for what? Well, she's hard to hear. Yeah, but she's talking to a wooden Indian. The other guy goes, well, I guess it'd be better to talk to a wooden Indian than to be one. And sometimes we're wooden Indians, aren't we? We don't say anything, let alone what she did. She spilled Jesus out with everything that she had, even though this was a, a dumb, mute you know, whatever, standing there, she witnessed as though it was the last thing that she could do. And sometimes we're just afraid to witness. Why? I think you have to draw the, the equals line and say, we just don't know God well enough. Because you're usually afraid to talk about that which you don't know very much about. And we've all been around the boastful people that know everything about everything, and we don't want to be like that. But people want to know, do you really love Jesus or is he one of these things that's kind of your fire insurance policy that you kind of got in your hip pocket but you never bring out until there's a catastrophe? You know, Enoch wasn't. And God just swooped him up. Did a little addition here just in case you were interested. Not that you can't add up on your own and not that I'm going to do because I didn't even get the calculator out, so I may have messed this up. But if Enoch's dad, Jared, had him at 162, okay? And then Enoch lived 65 years and had his first son, Methuselah, that, you know, would put uh, Jared then, you know, you add those two together, that would put him in Methuselah's life right there. But then 300 more years, Jared's now 527. Methuselah's now how old? 300, all right? And so at 527 and a son at 365, dad loses his child. It would be similar if you take the 10% rule in, similar to somebody that's 53 losing a child that's 36. And my dad's a little bit, he's 20 years older than me, but it would be similar to what that would be. Again, I don't believe that any parent ever plans on burying their child. And strangely enough, Jared didn't have to bury him, but he lost him. He's just gone. And I don't know if God made clear to everybody what happened. There's nothing here that says it was like Elijah where everybody witnessed him going up. It was just he was gone. Methuselah, what happened to him? This oldest son of Enoch, man, 300 years old, still right in the prime of life, you know, but where's dad? Grandpa, have you seen him? So there's 227 years difference between Methuselah and, and uh, Jared. And yet, you know, grandpa, he's going, grandpa, where's dad? I don't know, where is he? You know, and it's just, he's gone. But you think about that, because in our day and age, that would be a devastating loss. Methuselah goes on to live another 435 years, so he dies when he's 962. That, or that, not Methuselah, Jared, excuse me. He lives another 435 years, so 
altogether, you know, I mean, Methuselah gets to know his grandfather for 735 years. Amazing, isn't it? I mean, that's just flat out like, wow. Can you imagine knowing somebody 735 years, but he still lived without his dad for the last 400 and some years of his life. And the dad lived without his son for the last 400 some years. So, I mean, as we look at this now, what's really interesting with old Methuselah, I guess Methuselah lived another 234 years. I misspoke there after uh, J- Jared, his dad. So he lost his dad at 365 when his dad was 365. He lost his grandfather when he was 962. That would have put him at 735. Guess how long Methuselah lived till he was 969. So he lived for another 234 years. But if you really go back and you read the rest of this, and I trust its accuracy, guess what happened with Methuselah? Yep, he died. Do you know when? More than likely in the flood. At the very least, he died the year of the flood. But I think it's very likely he died in the flood. Because he sure wasn't on the ark. And it could have just been ironically that the beginning of that year that he died and the flood came at the middle or the end of the year. I don't know and I can't speak of that. But I think how strange, how weird would that be that you have a father that is just so crazy about God that God just picks him up and takes him home and a son that never got it, that when God sends the warning and says, hey man, get on the boat, Methuselah didn't pay any attention but went ahead and continued to do his own thing. At least I know this, that he died the year of the flood. Now whether he died in the water or he was buried before that happened, we don't know. But it's a strong possibility that he never got it. And in that same regard, there are no guarantees because you see Christianity or godliness and this true relationship aren't hereditary. Just because you're strong doesn't mean your children will be. But what it does mean, at least as to to me, if I had children, was I want to do everything I can that they're at least aware of God and not just who God is, but why I follow him and that I love him. And so I challenge you, and I don't lay it down as a gauntlet, but rather instead as a begging, pleading kind of a, Man, for God's sake, for your sake and your child's future, do everything you can with your life that they would believe and know that God isn't just something that you are obligated to, but rather someone, a person that you're in love with. You see, when you don't pray, and I'm not talking about just at meals, and I'm not talking about at bedtime, but when you don't reflect to your children or your grandchildren that prayer is is really being able to convey anything that would become any kind of a burden to you to God. And that prayer is not only being able to share your burdens and know that there's someone strong enough to handle, but on top of it, that also your prayers that with them, that what you're doing is you're sharing your life with God and you're praising him. I mean, I look back and I had the fortunate, uh, I was fortunate enough to have both a dad and a granddad, or uh, my dad is still alive, but that worship. My dad called me last Sunday And said, hey, man, he said, uh, your mom and I decided uh, we went to church Saturday night with a group of the people. It's a large church that they attend out there. And he said, we went to the Saturday night service and we got up this morning to watch you here for our Sunday morning service. It was kind of like being at branches with you. Now, they're three hours different because they're out in Phoenix right now. So that means at 10 o'clock here, it was 7 a.m. out there. You know what that did for me? One, that they cared enough to watch, but two that I knew that they got up early to be able to do it and tune it in. And I know that they're not computer people necessarily, but they were able to figure out the live streaming deal. But you know what it really means the most to me? They could have said, we've had church for our week, but they wanted some more. And that they would share it with us. And see, to me, that's, I can't tell you how valuable that is to me with them alive right now, let alone if they die before I do let alone if I die before they do. But I can't begin to say, knowing my granddad, my grandma, and knowing that I had the privilege of knowing that they didn't just go to church, that they lived God. That we didn't just pray at the meals and we didn't just say prayers, thanks for the food, let's eat. But we prayed. And knowing that, you know, if somebody called them up and said, would you pray for us? That they would stop and they would pray right then. Knowing that they would praise God for things. Knowing that when the rain would come, that dad and granddad would reach their hands up and say, thank you, Lord, we needed this so bad. Or sometimes when it was raining and raining and raining, and it would be, finally it would break. Thank you, God. You know, would you bless the crops now? 
I mean, I can't begin to tell you how much the foundation inside of me was because of not just them telling me what to believe. No, it was about seeing them believe. And so you have the power and the ability to do something, and I want to encourage you with it. But I want to tell you that Christianity is taught, but it's also caught. And by the way that it's caught is by people that know you and love you see that you know and love God because you talk about Him. Not because you preach at them and not because you shove things down their throat, but rather instead you live in such a compelling way that they're intrigued or that they're overwhelmed with the fact that, man, you really believe this stuff. But you can't do that with religion. You can do it with the relationship. Anyway, God took him away. As I studied this out, that was one of the things that I wondered. Wow, God. What kind of life would I have to live in a way that you couldn't stand it any longer and you'd sweep me off my feet and bring me to heaven? I mean, I know from his covenant and through the blood of Jesus Christ that when I die, he'll sweep me up to heaven. But wow, how would I have to live and in what way would I live to the point that I was so pleasing to him that he couldn't stand being apart any longer? Now, we only have, as I mentioned, the two that's ever talked about, and I don't want to pretend myself to be, but I want to live in such a way that God would be pleased enough that it wouldn't be because of his obligation and his covenant that he has to, and the contract that he has to take me. I pray instead it would be out of the relationship that he couldn't wait for me. And you see, if we live in that way, I think funerals become something different than sadness. And instead of fearing death, we begin to look at it as a graduation. Oh, yeah, I mean, when we graduate from junior high to high school, there's some fear and trepidation. And yet at the same time, isn't there some desire that's there? Because, man, at least I always wanted to be, what's next? And I know not everybody approaches life that way. When we graduated from college and you begin to feel like, man, now it's when it really, did you really learn anything? Can you earn a living with what you know? But, you know, when we graduate from life, what's the next date? It's no state at all if you've lived an eternal life while you're in this body. The only thing you're doing is leaving the tent behind and you're going to the mansion. You're getting out of the Winnebago and you're getting something permanent. But we live like we believe that this body is what it's all about and that being here on this earth, we're going to make it so grand. And it's the part that intrigues me with God because I look at him and I go, Lord, why am I in America? I'm not disappointed. I'm not uh, regretting the luxuries that we have. I'm just concerned. Have we allowed our luxuries to separate us instead of endearing us even more toward God to separate us? Would we be better off if we were slaves someplace? If we didn't have anything? If we didn't have any electricity? If we had to grow and find the not only what we could try to grow in a garden, but to find other stuff to survive on with the trees and the wildlife that there is, would we be more dependent upon God? In a lot of ways, I think we would. And I think we'd see him every day because you'd see that hand-to-mouth thing really works like that. But when we get the feeling that we've done what we've done and we know how to make money now and we know how to keep it going, and if it's not there, we can use our charge card on top of it all, it's real easy to begin to forget about God and just get into living. And the truth of the matter is, I don't think it's much of a life. But this one is the one that just ends in that regard. I'm going to wrap up here with a couple of different verses, if you will, just to kind of look at. I'll give them to you. You can go back and read and ponder. If you will, stop off at the book of John as you flip back over to the New Testament, the Gospel of John. So I just want to look at this walk because it says that Enoch walked with God. So I want to close out this evening with uh, some passage about walking and what Jesus had to say about it, okay? In John chapter 8, following the story about the woman caught in adultery and Jesus' merciful nature, not only toward her, but especially to her accusers. The next thing we read is that when Jesus spoke again to the people in John chapter 8, verse 12, When Jesus spoke again to the people, so the next thing that John writes that he had to say was, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, will have the light of life. So if we follow Jesus, we won't walk in darkness. If we're walking in darkness, we're not following him. 
is what the reality is there, right? I have to trust and presume that Jesus knew what he was talking about. I have to trust and presume then that a part of Enoch walking with God was he sought the light. Instead of the temptatious life, instead of the sinister life, instead of those things that you would try to cover up, he just walked in the midst of it and he was what he was and he believed that God was what he was. From there, if you will, go over to uh, the uh, first John, which is clear back shortly before Revelation back there in those short little letters. But in first John chapter one, John continues to talk about this Jesus that was the light of the world. And he brings out some more things for us to look about with our walk. Now, John's writing to whom? He's writing to Christians. John's writing to those that are believers, but he's writing to people because already by this time in John's life, people had kind of gotten into this thing of where they do uh, uh, more the religion to where they boast about and claim this and claim that. And so as you read 1 John, one of the things that comes out, if we claim, but then what we're doing is we're really fooling ourselves. So 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, this is the message we've heard from him and we declare to you, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet we walk in the darkness, the truth is we what? We lie and we don't live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, like Jesus, or as he is in light, excuse me, <coughs> if we walk in the light, we have fellowship not only with Jesus, but with one another. And in the midst of that fellowship, guess what happens? The blood of Jesus' son purifies us from all sin. John had this concept and he understood that not only is God light, we need to walk with him, but we do a lot better job, like I was saying last Sunday morning, when we walk together with him. This fellowship of Christians helps so that we walk in the light even more. And he said, when you're doing that, the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. It's almost like it's this, you know, like your washing machine when the agitator is in there going back and forth like that, that this blood then just continues to purify us. And the picture is more and more and more. And you say, well, I thought if I'm pure, I'm pure. Well, but it's almost like, you know, you let the blood have even a greater effect on you because we rub off on each other. And as we all pursue and we help each other walk in this path of light, what really begins to take place is we become lighter. Now, I realize that that's kind of a weird play on words, but we become more of that which cast his light and we benefit, mutually benefit each other. And we feel cleansed from our sins instead of reminding and praying that we're cleansed from our sins, as he goes on to say then later. Then in the next book of John, 2 John here, and it's just got a few verses to it, but uh, I want to read with you here then in verse 4. 2 John 4, and I mean, they say it's verse 4. It could be chapter 4 if you want to look at it as little chapters. But it says, it has given me great joy. So 2 John, it's right after 1 John, but it's given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we've had from the beginning, and I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you've heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. And so this is where then John doesn't necessarily ratchet it up, but he, he increases the peripheral vision here to understand that walking with Jesus isn't just going to church. It's no, it's, it's growing in him to the point that you walk a life of love, just like what Christ did, that you, you know, Philippians 2 says that our attitude should be like of Christ who considered others better than himself. And there wasn't anybody better than Jesus, but he lived and treated people like they were. And that's what love is in that regard. And that's what the church is to be known for. And then finally, it's not John. We're done with John here, but go over the next or two pages here because the next one is third John. I'm going to jump over to the book of Jude. And I want to close out then with this this evening. Because Jude, um, and, and I just love this letter. And most of you know that, that uh, I, I find it just so, I don't know, curious because it's like what I felt at certain times. I go plan to go one direction with the sermon and get in the midst and then I feel like it's shifting a different direction and, and I used to feel bad about that now I understand because Jude says although I wanted to write about or write you about this salvation that we share and I'm reading here now in verse three I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith to fight for it you know I wanted to write about the salvation but I man you got to fight for faith that was once and all entrusted to the saints. For certain men whose condemnation was written long ago have secretly slipped in among you, and they are godless men that change the 
grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Not just sovereign Lord, our sovereign and our Lord. I love that. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you in the Lord, that the Lord excuse me, delivered his people out of Egypt, but even though they were all delivered, later he destroyed those that did not believe, did not continue in their faith. And the angels that did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. So here he's going on into saying, you know, don't presume but contend. Don't just call and claim faith rather contend that you keep it and that you keep help others keep within it because there are those that in the past have claimed the same faith and god had done stuff in their lives and he mentions the children of israel out of egypt and he now he mentions the angels in heaven that were later on kicked out of heaven they didn't keep their positions of authority so he kicked them out and in verse seven in a similar way got sodom and gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion and they serve as an example of those that suffer the punishment of eternal fire in that very same way these dreamers talking about these teachers that lead people to believe oh well it doesn't make any difference what you do these same dreamers pollute their own bodies they reject authority they slander celestial beings and he reminds us that even the uh, archangel michael who's one of the only two angels that are even mentioned in the bible he disputed with the devil about the body of Moses, but when he did, he didn't dare to bring a slanderous accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Michael, the archangel, strong and powerful, doing God's bidding. I believe that God sent him to pick up the body of Moses. In the midst of that, the devil said, uh-uh, I want him. And Michael didn't get into some kind of a taunting, well, I'm bigger than you, you know. Instead, he just said, may the Lord rebuke you. And he took the body back with him. So he said, yet these men speak abusively against whatever they don't understand. And boy, isn't that our politicians today? And what things they do understand by instinct, like unreasoning animals, these are the very things that destroy them. And he goes on to woe to them, blah, blah, blah. They have taken the way of Cain, rushed for profit into Balaam's error, been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. We talked about Cain last week, that when somebody else had something he wanted, he killed him. And he said, these men are blemishes. And again, this is referring to preachers, and teachers that would lead people to believe that christianity is this license for immorality and that faith in jesus christ isn't worth fighting for okay so it goes on they're blemishes at your love feast eating with you without the slightest qualm shepherds who feed only themselves clouds without rain blown along by the wind autumn trees without fruit and uprooted twice dead which is really an insult okay they are wild waves of the sea foaming up their shame wandering stars from whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever so in the midst of all that then jude says and who was jude the brother of jesus christ also didn't believe in him at first but came to believe in him enoch he said the seventh from adam seventh major generation talked about from adam prophesied about these men so this is one little insight into what the 300 years of him walking with god Enoch shared this with the people of his time. See, the Lord's coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone. So Enoch, back there, before Moses, before all this other stuff, man, Enoch's preaching and he's telling them, he said, man, you're not gonna believe this, but God told me he's gonna come with thousands upon thousands of holy ones and he's bringing a judgment. Everybody will be judged. That's why I say I think it's really creepy when you begin to see that even his son may not have listened because he died during the flood or the year of the flood and it's just phenomenal to me he's, he's he's preaching this i mean we think he's nuts what do you know about that who do you think you are you know and the same thing they probably thought about Noah when he's out there building the boat but but the lord's coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones he's going to judge everyone he's going to convict all the ungodly of the ungodly acts that they have done in an ungodly way Sounds to me like everything is pretty ungodly and, and Enoch saying, let's get godly. And of all the harsh words that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires and boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. So Enoch, Jude talks about him. Now, how did Jude know that? Same way that Enoch knew what God had said, God revealed to Jude that this is what Enoch's ministry was about because it puts it in quotes. So he's saying, this is what God told me that Enoch said. 
And so why do we need to contend for the faith? Why do we need to walk in the light? Why do we need to walk in love? Why do we need to walk with each other so that we can be sure that we're agitating in a good way, bringing about this continual cleansing of God's blood or Jesus' blood upon us? Man, because he's worth it. And because the world around us is continually trying to bring us down and away. And it doesn't mean that we've got to become some kind of holy rollers in the sense of, of pretending. It just means, man, if we walk in holiness, people will see the light. And if we're not ashamed of God, we'll speak about him. And we don't have to be in people's faces about it. We can just speak about him. But especially for our children and those that we love. God and Father, tonight, might you let your word sink in and let us not forget. Might